Lord, we give you the glory and we bless your holy name forever. There is none like you, Lord, in all the earth. Your glory is far above the heavens. For who is like you, Lord, in all the earth? Your name is great. Ilamina ko se prevelen di na magusati pra ados baile na magususu presto perandos. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We bless your name tonight. We thank you because you are glorious in our midst. Thank you, Lord, for your presence. This tangible inheritance that separates us from the inhabitants of the earth. For we know that we have the God of the universe, the creator of the heavens and the earth and everything in it. He is in our midst. He is our God. And he is our rock. And so Lord, we give glory to your glory and praise to your praise. We join the host of angels in heaven that sing unending praise, calling to one another, only is the Lord. The earth is filled with his glory. And we, the chief of your creation, come to give you praise tonight. Let every word of our mouth and the meditation of our heart be pleasing unto you. Speak to us, not as children, but as mature ones. Speak to us not just with milk but give us the meat of your word that we may attain unto a statue that is able to give expression to your intentions in the earth thank you lord because you always hear us in jesus supernatural most powerful name i pray amen and amen um good evening um, good morning, good afternoon, whatever time zone you're watching me from all over the world. Apostle Victor again is my name. And this is again Life Spring Assembly. And I want to bless God for you. Um, yes, you. Um, I'm super excited for what God is set to do in the time that we the times that we're living in. Um, if you are very sensitive in the spirit, you can see that God has already begun his work. And this work, God didn't just think about it. He didn't just start it. Um, he had started this work a long time ago. He had completed the plan for this work a long time ago. Excuse me. And this work is just beginning to find expression in the time that we've come into. Tonight, I had a topic that I wanted to speak about. I had a topic that I wanted to speak about and whilst i was um getting ready um the holy spirit whispered into my heart and he said change it so this is it the, i'm not going to tell you the topic i wanted to speak about but the topic i wanted to speak about is like a phrase that has god in the inside of you okay so think about it. let's just take something for an example now give me something that has god on the inside of you like uh, the presence of god say the presence of god or um, how to hear from God or something like that you get you get it you get it just so the topic I was going to speak about tonight was something like that and the Holy Spirit whispered to me and he said remove everything and just leave God the Holy Spirit said to me I heard it it was so clear I tried to ignore it because I'm not prepared to speak about God. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I feel the presence of God so strong around me right now. I, I tried to ignore the voice. Not like I tried. I ignored it. I ignored it. I carried on. I was like, no, I'm going to speak about what I want to speak about tonight. This is what I'm prepared to speak about. And the Holy Spirit, he, he, he wouldn't leave me alone. He said, remove it. Remove everything and let God. And I'm thinking, what am I going to speak about? This is like, this is the biggest, that would be like the biggest topic ever. I've ever had. And I wouldn't even know where to start. So what do I want to say? What angle do I want to come from? God is too big. What, what am I going to say about this God? In that moment, I was so overwhelmed. 
I was overwhelmed. But the Holy Spirit didn't consider my emotions. He said, take everything out. And speak about God. And I said, me? Me speak about God? In fact, let me tell you the topic I was going to speak about. I was going to speak about walking with God. Okay? I was going to speak about a topic, walking with God. And I, I don't want to say I had to figure it out, but the Holy Spirit had ministered to my heart. So I knew the pathway to go through. And of course, as we begin to preach and as we begin to speak, the Holy Spirit expands and it breathes upon us so that we can bring forth the preceding word. So I was confident and I was excited to hear what God would say about working with God. So I was going to come here tonight to tell you guys how your walk with God is more important to God than anything else that you do for Him. Your walk with God is more important to God than your service to God. This was what I was going to come to speak about tonight. And then all of a sudden the Holy Spirit interrupted and He said, remove everything. He literally said, delete everything and just leave God. So, I'm saying that to say to God tonight that He's going to have to speak to you guys. <laughs> Oh, hallelujah to Jesus. So, I perceive now that this is going to be a series. Okay? I perceive this is going to be a series. It is impossible to preach about God in a sermon. It's impossible. It's impossible. So, Holy Spirit, help us tonight. Give us depth. Prove to us tonight that you are the God who gives wisdom to the wise. And you are the one who give knowledge to the to the to the scholar. And to you belong the hidden, the secret things. But the Bible says in Psalm 25, verse 14, that the secret of the Lord is with those that fear him, and he will show them his covenants. Lord, can we ask you to show us your secret tonight? And reveal to us your covenants. That we may be fitting. To do your bidding according to divine ordination in Jesus' name, amen. So, this is what I'm gonna do I'm gonna just start from somewhere, and then, um, then the Holy Spirit will guide us, okay? But then I want to speak about God now. I don't know if you have ever considered thinking about God as a subject of your meditation. You know, we meditate about so many things. You can meditate about faith, and meditate about holiness, meditate about um, grace and salvation and a billion and one things to, 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 to meditate about. But have you ever stopped and paused to think about God? Have you ever stopped to think about God? Now, let's begin to give ourselves a bit of picture. I'm going to try by the help of the Holy Spirit to paint a picture in your mind tonight. To provoke your spirit to begin to long for God. To begin to long for God. David said, as the day pants for the water, so my soul longs for thee. And if you've ever watched a safari documentary and you've seen animals and um, documentaries made of the wild, you see when a deer begins to pant for water, at that point, it is either the deer finds the water or the deer dies. And the deer begins to, it begins to pant for water. It begins to long for water. And, and the writer of that sound, the psalmist said, as the deer pants, for the water brook, as the deer pants for the water, as the deer is now at the mercy, the survival and the existence, the continuous, the sustenance of the life of this deer is now at the mercy of the deer finding the brook. So also my soul, the, the sustenance, the existence, uh, my existence, my essence, my sustenance is now dependent on me finding you. 
God. And this God is who we speak about tonight. And often in scripture, we have seen God introduce himself as the God of men. So, for example, in Exodus chapter number 3, in Exodus chapter number 3, God, um, verse 13, Exodus chapter number 3, verse 13, it says, But Moses protested, if I go to the people of Israel and tell them, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you. They will ask me, what is his name? Then what should I tell them? And then verse 14. Very, very fascinating, interesting verse of the Bible. And it has been my contemplation in the last few weeks. Why God introduced himself as what I'm about to read to you. Exodus chapter number 3, verse number 14. God replied to Moses, I am who I am. God replied to Moses. Now, this was not God introduced himself to Moses. Then he told Moses how to tell the people who he is. And he also gave them an his, his introduction that they must give to the king when they go to take his message to the king. And I want you to understand the progression in this introduction of God. Now this was an I think it is very, very profound why the Holy Spirit point, uh, prompted me to start from the scriptures tonight because this was a Moses who he knows that he is a Jew. And by Jew, he means he is a descendant of the... He is a member of the nation called Israel. Um, according to scriptures, Jews are the descendants of the tribe of Judah. But also Jews is also, um, it, it has become a national identity for the Israelites. So they just call all of them the Jews. Okay, But really, by descent and origin, Jews are the descendants of the family of Judah, okay, one of the sons of Jacob. So, Moses at this point, he knows that he is an Israelite. Even though he was raised in the house, in the palace of Pharaoh, he knew that he was not an Egyptian. Okay, he knew that he was a Jew. And he knew that the Jews are a different set of people in the earth. He knew it. The, the, the Egyptians knew it. And because Moses was raised an Egyptian and raised in a powerful family, the ruling family, the controlling family in the land of Egypt, which happens to be the strongest nation in the world at the time or one of the strongest nations in the world at the time he knew he was an Israelite and he knew that the Israelites are Israelites because of a God do you understand this? but he doesn't know this God never met this God Never heard anything about this God. He didn't grow up among the Israelites. So he didn't, he didn't grow up with the story of this God. But he knew. They knew the Israelites by their commitment to their own God. And what made the Israelites different among the nations of the earth was because they, they are this set of people who believe in having only one God. 
every other nation in the earth, then the, the, the practice paganism. And what separates paganism from um, the Abrahamic covenant is that pagans believe in having multiple gods for multiple things. Okay, so they have different gods for different things. They have the god of God, they have gods for fertility, they have gods for protection, they have gods for war, they have gods for wealth, they have gods for love, they have gods for they have gods for just about anything, gods for um, agriculture and stuff like that. These are the ways, this is the way of the um, the heathen, the, the pagans. But the the Israelites as a group of people in the earth believe in only one God. As a matter of fact, there is a very, very strong, strong um, statement in the Torah that is so drilled into the subconscious of the Jews and it's that the Lord your God is one God. Okay? The Lord your God is one God. So, this was part of the unique identity that the children of Israel had in the earth um, in that they worship just one God and and the nations of the earth um, at this time the God of the Jews was not famous yet okay at this time the God of the Jews was not famous yet even though they are known to be associated with one God their God wasn't famous yet And God was about to make himself famous. He was about to noise his fame in the earth. Tonight I'm speaking about God. I'm just going to lay a foundation. And then on Sunday we're going to build on that foundation. And like I always do, I'm not going to stop speaking about this topic until I have done justice to it. As the Spirit gives utterance. So, Moses had his first encounter with God. And I'm speaking tonight, and maybe you're watching me tonight, and you've heard about, you know, you've heard uh, the term God, and you heard the concept of God, but you've never really taken time to zoom in to really find out who is this God? What is this God? I pray tonight that God will give you an encounter. That you will indeed meet God. And can I just tell you, just like a bit of good news, God really desires to meet you. He really wants to know you and He really wants you to know Him. And when I say He really wants to know you, it doesn't mean that He doesn't know you. <laughs> it simply means He wants to meet you. He knows you. He knows you more than you know yourself. You are the one who is yet to know Him. But God desire for that um, meeting to take place. Okay, where you know him and when you begin to desire to know him as you are known by him so this was Moses' first encounter with God so he knows that there is a God but that God is vague just like God is vague to so many of you watching me today and maybe you even go to church but God is still vague you, you don't know, you've never encountered this God they tell you that that God lives in church but newsflash, God does not live in church. And by church, I mean your building, your, your church building, or in the name of your church. God does not live in those things. So Moses had fled Egypt at this time. Fled Egypt at this time. And one day he was tending to his father-in-law's flock and he took them far away. And can I tell you something? Did you think that Moses just decided to go far away on this day? No. It was God was beckoning to him to come. Because the psalmist would say, Lord, call unto me and I will come. If God does not call to you, you cannot come to him. You, in other words, you cannot wake up one day and say, I'm going to God. Or, I'm going to go know this God. It's impossible. If you begin to feel the yearning and the desire to know God, it is because God desires to know you. 
or God desires to reveal himself to you. He desires for you to know him. And how would you know? It is that God will place people like me in front of you, telling you that God wants to know you. And then God will begin to overwhelm you with different things that begins to give you an indication that maybe it is time for me to step out of this mediocre life and really pursue true spirituality. And so I make my first conclusion tonight, first conclusion tonight by boldly declaring to you that God desires for you to know him. And God has ordained and orchestrated this season as a season of encounter when men will begin to encounter God and God will no longer be vague to people anymore. I'm going somewhere tonight. Again, I'm just laying a foundation. So, God replied Moses. So, when God appeared to Moses, let's see what God said. Let's see, let's see what happened. Let's go back a little bit. Let's go back a little bit. Let me start from verse number 1. Exodus chapter 3, verse number 1. One day, Moses was standing the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led the flock far into the wilderness and came to Sinai. Now, Leading the flock far. So much so that it got to Sinai. It was not because on that day, Moses just felt like taking a longer stroll. No. It was, it was a day orchestrated in the spirit for Moses to meet the Lord. And did Moses pray for this? No, he didn't. He doesn't even know how to pray. <laughs> so perhaps you're saying, Maybe I will never know God because I don't pray. Maybe I will never know God because I don't do anything religious. I don't even know how to do anything religious. I have never done anything religious. I, 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 and I, I think, I perceive in my spirit that this is the reason why God wants me to speak about this topic. God wants me to, by the help of the Holy Spirit, destroy the yoke of the wall that the world has built between people and God. You know this general consensus like God only deals with some people and God is not for everybody. And not everybody can reach God. And unfortunately some people carry themselves in church and this is all their attitude, their pride is saying to people as though God is just an inheritance for some of us. So you see people like us and we pray God just shows us. No, you're not special. There is nothing that God shows you that God doesn't want to show anyone else. It is because men don't press to see. I'm going somewhere tonight. I believe that Holy Spirit wants me to demystify by the help and the wisdom of the Spirit, of course. This stinking thinking, this terrible mentality that separates people from God, that makes people sit down in mediocrity and makes people give up. Give up sitting in darkness. God desires above everything else to be known. He desires to be known. And the reason is because by nature, by nature, God is hidden. By nature, God is hidden. Now, God does not try to hide. By nature. And the nature of God is that he is spirit. And so by his spiritual nature, God is hidden. You know the virus, coronavirus, if coronavirus was in the room where you are listening to me right now, you could not see it. You can't see it. No matter how much you shine your eyes and, and open your eyeballs until your eyeballs begin to want to pop out of the socket, you cannot, you will not see coronavirus with your naked eyes. But when you deploy the use of a telescope or a microscope, microscope, then you would see it. Into the microscope, the coronavirus will be so 
obvious. It will just be there right in front of your eyes. Because you have now engaged or you have received the help of a lens. And this lens has the capacity to make hidden things obvious. So the fact that you cannot see coronavirus does not mean the coronavirus is not there. You just cannot see it. And why can you not see it? Is it because you desire not to see it? No. Even if you desire to see it, you still will not see it. Because by nature, the virus is hidden. Not because the virus is doing hide and seek. Not because the virus wants to hide from you. In fact, as far as the virus is concerned, the virus is out in public. He's saying, I'm here. I'm here. Over here. On your door handle, I'm here. Don't just look on your mask, on your shirt, I'm here. The virus is everywhere. But people do not sustain their ability. They do not sustain, sustain the optical sophisticatedness to see the virus. So God is spirit. And by a nature, so write that down. That's the first disclosure about God. God is spirit. God is spirit. And the spirit is the Lord. God is spirit. And the spirit is the Lord. And because God is spirit, God cannot just be, because God is spirit and because man is flesh, man cannot just stumble into God. Man cannot just see God. Man cannot just decide to see God, decide to know God, decide to lay hold of God. God can only be revealed. You want to write that down? God can only be revealed. God can only be revealed. So, the virus, the coronavirus, or any other microorganism placed right in front of you, you cannot strain to see it. There is no tactic you want to employ that would make the virus visible to your eyes. If you must see the virus, you must employ the the help of a magnifying lens that has the ability to magnify the virus. Now, I'm not saying God is small. I'm using, I'm using the virus as an example of something, though it is obvious, yet it is hidden because of its nature. The nature of viruses is that they are so tiny and so small. So tiny and so small. The nature of God is that he is spirit. And by his spirituality, he is hidden from a physical person, a physical people. Now, just as the microscope now becomes the bridge, so by nature, the virus lives or exists in a world that is far from the access or the intentional access of men by nature. And if men must understand and know and interact with viruses, men need something to bridge the gap, the difference between the, the realities that these two different distinct creatures find themselves. Men live in the reality of everything that is big, tangible, seeable, touchable. And viruses live in the reality. It, they, they, are, they are available, yet it looks like they are not here. Yet they are here. Because of their small nature. Their tiny nature. And in order for this obvious nature and this not so obvious nature to interact there is need for the for employing the, the the use of a magnifying lens a microscope now in this context of god now god being a spirit is hidden 
and you can there is no magnifying lens you can go find to scope God out. <laughs> There is no magnifying lens. There is no equipment. There is no science. There is no technology available in the realms and in, within the, the confines of what men have crafted for themselves that is sophisticated enough to figure out and to bring out God. If God must be seen, it is God himself that will hand you the equipment by which you will access it. Do you understand this? So think about the fact that, think about, or let's say, the viruses, they are the ones that hand out to you the microscope by which you can see them. Okay, so that's the idea that I'm trying to bring out here now. God is the one that facilitates and makes it possible for something else that is far away from him to be able to perceive and to know him. So, by nature, God is hidden. Not because he wants to hide, but because he dwells in a reality, in a realm that is far above, far away from the dwelling of anything else, anything else. Not just men. Because you would think that, oh, spirits have more access to God than people. You, you lie. You make a mistake. Even spirits cannot see God and spirits cannot know God except God wants to be known to those spirits. Oh, how would you say that? The Bible says that if they are known, the princes of this world, if they are known, they would not have crucified the king of glory. Our Lord of glory. If they are known, they will not have cru crucified him. The, and you know that the devil is the spirit at work in the sons of disobedience. So the princes of this world, the Roman empires of this world, the, the religious rulers who connive together to kill Jesus, if they had known, they would not have killed him. But you know that they were not acting on their own will. They were carrying out the will of a spirit that assists them. And this spirit is the devil. So it is actually the devil that killed Jesus. He is the one that orchestrated the death of Jesus. And if he had known that this death will mean the end of everything he, th he thinks he, he has secured, then he will do everything within his power to make sure that Jesus never dies. In other words, he will do the opposite of what he did. But because he was ignorant, so, and the devil is a spirit. So don't ever think, oh, maybe our disadvantage is that we're just we're flesh. No, even spirits cannot find God out. And one of the biggest mistakes the devil made too, the reason why he brought war to heaven and attempted to find God was this the same illusion where he thought he knew God enough. He thought he knew him enough. So much so that he thought he stood a chance displacing him. He thought he stood a chance exalting his throne to rival God. He thought he stood a chance defeating God. And the only reason why he would feel he stood a chance was because he thought he knew everything there is to be known about God. So he thought he had studied God in eternity. I don't want to say for many years because they were not, there wasn't years in the realm where they lived. They lived in eternity. But he thought he knew God but he forgot that he didn't exist from eternity. God did. He was created. There was a time where the devil began to exist. When Lucifer began to exist. And he does not know how long God had been before he began to exist. But he thought that he had used his existence to study God enough that he knew enough to talk with his government. To rival and to confront his wisdom and his power. And of course, he failed. So, I said all of that to say that even spirits cannot, as an act of their own will, just wake up and decide to figure God out. It's impossible. So, that's why I said anything that must encounter God will encounter God on the premises of revelation. 
that God chooses to reveal himself. So God is spirit and God can only be revealed. And God is the one who chooses to reveal himself. I want you to hold on to that. Never lose it. Never lose it. And by nature, God is hidden. Not because God is hiding, but by the virtue of the realm that God dwells in and the difference and the contrast between the realm that we dwell in and the realm that God dwell in, God is hidden. Okay? So it must be, you. in order to see God, in order to experience God, you must make a conscious, deliberate effort to journey. And when I say journey here, I don't mean cover miles and kilometers and because that's not how it works in the spirit. It is to change nature. Do you understand this? It is nature that forms the distance between man and God, between flesh and spirit. It is nature. It is the difference in nature. And in order to bridge this gap, there must be a flux. There must be a change in nature. Okay? Two things that must interact must have the same nature. So, if you must interact with God, you must change to His kind of spirit, not just His spirit. Okay? Not just change. Not just be spiritual. No, you must change to God's kind of spirit in order to see God. And God then becomes obvious to you as everything else is obvious to you. So when you see some people and you ever wonder, why do these people just believe in this unseen God? And they are so convicted. Yeah, it is because such people have experienced a change in nature by which God has now become real to them just like your breakfast is real to you and your necklace and your wristwatch is real to you. You can literally look at your hand and touch it and say, yeah, it is there. The same way, God has become real to us because we have partaken of his nature and this was because of his generosity and his desire to be known. In fact, we were created human beings. We were created to know God. God desires to be known. And that became the, the business case. For those of you who um, are familiar with project management, it became the business case for the project of man. If you want to do any project, you have to have a business case, isn't it? And then in the business case, that's what, that is what will capture the intention why this, why this project? What do you want to achieve with this project? What is the scope of this project? How big is it going to be? Um, what, what is it meant to solve? What is it meant to achieve? So, if God ever had a business case, the summation of God's business case was that he wants man to know him. He wants to be known. Now, what that knowledge will give back to is dominion. God is a powerful being that whoever sees him, whoever sees him will become him. <laughs> whoever sees him, whoever sees God will become God. And so, the dominion that is the mandate of man is at the mercy of the man seeing God. And when I say see here, I mean to know God. And to know, he's synonymous to the word that you are conversant with is, uh, is intercourse. So to know is not a knowledge. Like I know that the grass is green. No, no. To know here is to have intimate relationship. Like what you know as sexual intercourse. Okay, it is a point where words don't do justice to the depth of knowledge or the depth of what has been shared. So God created men to know him to the end that men will become him. And men becoming God means that men will rule because God is a king and he rules. Okay, so um, I hope God is blessing you tonight. I, I, I feel like the reason why the Holy Spirit got me to start speaking about this is it really desire, God really wants to kickstart his intention this year that he wants people to know him. He wants people to come to know him. 
So I will try to break it down as simple as possible. And of course, we're then going to be going to more deep things about God. But everyone will have understanding as God gives in Jesus' name. So, again, so let's try to read the scripture one more time. And I'm going to round up now because I don't want to take too much time. I believe I've given you a very, very decent introduction to God. And you can literally use your fingers to, you know, bullet point it. God is spirit. God by nature, which is being spirit, God is hidden. Not because he's hiding, but because he lives in a reality realm that is far away from the reality of anything else. God can only be revealed. It cannot be searched out. And he chooses those who he reveals himself to. And men are the chief primary subject that God designed for him to reveal himself to, that they may know him. And to know God is to become God. And to become God is to rule like God. Okay. So one day, Moses, and I've already given you a background story of this Moses guy, he belongs to a, a group of people that have God as their father. But Moses himself, I've never met God. No one has told him about this God. This was Moses' first encounter with God. Maybe you've heard about God. Maybe this is your first encounter. Because I'm trusting in the Holy Spirit that he will give you an encounter from this service in the name of Jesus. So one day Moses was standing the flock of his father Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led the flock far into the wilderness and he came to Sinai, the mountain of God. So Sinai was the mountain of God. And you know some people have said in scripture that the God of the Israelites is the God of the mountain. He is not the God of the valley. <laughs> there was a time that a nation came to fight the Israelites and the nation came and they were defeated. And so they took counsel among themselves to find out um, lessons learned. Okay? okay. So the lessons learned was that the God of the Israelites is the God of the mountain. So if you go to them on the mountain, you will never win. So Learn them and get them to come down into the valley. Their God does not know how to fight in the valley. He can only fight on the mountain. God, God associated with himself with mountains so much that even the heathen nation called God the God of the mountains. I'm going somewhere. But I will tell you what the mountain means. Because one thing with humanism is that we because of the limitation of the nature of man in his fallen state, men have trust in things that are tangible, things that they can see and touch and feel, tends to be more real to them than things that they can't touch, see or feel. So if you associate God with mountains so much, the danger is your humanity will kick in and you will start really thinking that God has something to do with physical mountains. And so, the psalmist will say something like, I will lift up my eyes onto the hills. From where is coming my help? Realize he didn't say my help comes from the mountain. No, he says my help comes from God. The one who made the heavens and the earth. And mountains are just things in the earth. Do you understand this? So, if God created the heavens and the earth, then the mountain if God then dwells on the mountain, then this mountain that God dwells in cannot be a physical mountain that results from a volcanic eruption. Do you understand what I'm saying? There is a mountain that is higher than the earth. There is a mountain that is higher than the heavens because the Bible says the Lord, he sits on his lofty throne. He is enthroned on high. He is enthroned on high. And this height where God is enthroned is not measured by 500 kilometers above sea level. Do you understand this? So if I say, let me give you an example. If I say the office of the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom is higher than the office of the Bay of London. Now, do you begin to measure that height by centimeters or kilometers? To say Boris Johnson is 75 kilometers above Sadiqan. <laughs> You see that it doesn't make any sense. But because we are employing the use of English word, the word high, your brain may then interpret it as, because if, if I say a truck is higher than a car, then you're thinking about 
centimeters and inches and meters and stuff like that. You're thinking about units of measurement that places something physically, um, physically extending its top higher than the top of something else. But when we say height in the spirit, we're not talking about the the we're not talking about altitude. Okay, we're not talking about altitude. We're talking about difference in the class of authority. Does that make sense? We're talking about difference in the class of authority. So, if I say the heavens are far above the earth, you're not going to start measuring uh, one meter high, two meter high, three meter high, four meter high, five meter high. That, that is foolishness. That You don't understand spirituality. Okay? It simply means science has messed up your... your <laughs> it has messed up your ability to, to understand truth. You are locked up in the realms of facts that you cannot know the truth. And only the truth can set free. Facts don't set you free. Facts are the truths of men. <laughs> but truths are realities of the spirit. And those realities are really real. So, when I say God dwells on high, it means he occupies a position of authority that is far above and cannot be compared to anything else. That is the height we're talking about here. When you see that in the Bible, that's what it means. So when we now say, God, who shall ascend unto the hills of the Lord and who shall stand on this holy mountain? We're not talking about a physical hill that you can climb with your legs. You cannot climb the hills of God with your legs. You cannot climb it with your legs. You must be carried on the wings of the eagles. Mount up with wings as eagle. You soar to this height. And soaring is not flapping. <laughs> it is that you are changed. Do you understand this? You are changed from glory to glory. From glory to glory, from glory to glory, from glory to glory. So that if I say the temperature of boiling water is higher than the temperature of water in room temperature, you will not start, you will not break out your tape rule, is it? Meanwhile, it is the water that will still become gas. Do you know that water exists in three states? It can be solid as ice. It can be liquid as water. And it can be gas. It becomes vapor. It becomes gas. But it is still the same water. But we can say the temperature of gaseous water is higher than the temperature of solid water, which is ice. Now, you don't start measuring that with the tape rule. The distance is a difference in state. Do you understand this? So to ascend onto the hills of the Lord is the change state. Rabat de equala te So you can say there is a ladder. So you can say the ice is the bottom step, and then the liquid. And even between the ice and the liquid, there are steps because the ice will be dissolving, 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 then it becomes liquid. And then the liquid starts getting hot and hot. And there is a temperature where you can still put your hand inside the water, isn't it? And there's a water, there's a, there's a temperature you can put you can put your hand and say, oh, what's this? It's just lukewarm. And there's a temperature you can put your hand and say, okay, it's warm. And then you can put your hand and feel, oh yeah, it's, it's, it's yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and there's a temperature you put your hand and you can remove, you, you, you put your hand, it's hot. But you can still put your hand, it's hot. And it's the temperature when, when you even move your hand so close, you feel the heat of the smoke coming out of it or the vapor, the gas. It is still water, but you don't need to touch the water to feel the water. So you can describe the temperatures as steps in the ladder of climbing from the bottom temperature to the high temperature. It is a change in state. So also, if God is high, 
than anything. It is that he exists in a state that is far out from the state of everything else. And to get to God is to change states until you enter into his state. So, Moses journeyed far into the wilderness and he came to Sinai. And I said, he came here, he's going on a date. He doesn't know he's going on a date, but God is bringing him to a date because God has chosen. So God has seen that the Israelites were suffering and God wanted to deliver them. And but because God is spirit, everything that was happening in this realm according to creation must be done by bodies. Okay, so because God is spirit, God needed a body through whom he will go to Egypt to rescue his people. And the body that God has prepared for this assignment was a body of a man called Moses. Just as your body was prepared for God to find entry into this realm to carry out an assignment. I repeat that again. Your body, I don't care how unspiritual you felt all your life. I don't care how far away from the realities of the spirit you have lived. I don't care if you don't know church or nobody in your family has ever gone to church. If you are listening to me today, I am telling you that if you have a body, touch yourself and see if you're, if you're real. Touch your chest, your hands, your face. Can you feel something? If you feel something, you have a body. If you have a body, your body was prepared to carry out things that have been written and concluded in the volume of the books of God. He has a business case for his project in the earth. And on each page, my Libra, I don't know about Samas, there are details of things that must be done. And so as we have come to 2021, there are details of God's eternal plan that must find expression in 2021 and beyond. And God has prepared certain bodies to be the ones through whom he will do it. And so if you're listening to me on any platform, if this is on YouTube, you're listening to me, or you're listening to me on Instagram, or you're listening to me on Facebook, or you're listening to me on Twitter, or you're listening to me on whatever social media platform on TikTok, God has ordained that you will be the body. You will, you will, he prepared your body. He prepared your body as a territory through which he will exercise his dominion on the earth. God needs you. God needs your body. He needs your temple. He needs your vessel. He needs your person to carry out his plan in the earth. And it is for this plan that you were given birth to. If you've ever asked yourself, why am I here? Why was I even born? What am I doing here? What's going on? What's life really about? You will never stop asking that question until you meet this personality that I'm introducing to you today. God. He is the one who had a plan. Do you understand this? You were not given birth to because of the plan of your dad or your mom. You were given birth to because there was a date that God had set. That you will encounter him. And by that encounter, you will come to the understanding of your ordination. And until that day, you are just passing time. And because God loves you, he sent me to you today to come speak to you about the personality, the most important personality in the whole of existence. He is God. The one who predestinated and the one who facilitated the beginning of existence itself. The creator of existence itself. He, it is his plan. It is his work. He is the one planning. He is the one working. We are just instruments by which he gives expression to his thoughts that exist with him in the spirit. So for every human being you see, it is God desires for something he is thinking to be felt, to be seen, to be experienced. So he sends bodies. And he sends these bodies preoccupied with with assignment locked up on the inside of them and the only one who can unlock it is God by his breath he breathes into man and men now have reason to live men now understand what their existence is for it is his breath that brings man to life and then you really live until then you're just there and the same way God ordained for Moses in Exodus chapter number 3 verse 1, the same way God orchestrated for Moses to encounter him, 
so that Moses can understand the reason why he was born that tiny baby. Why, when all babies were dying, God preserved his life by giving his mom and his parents boldness to put him on a basket and put him on the water. And God entered and touched the heart of the daughter of Pharaoh to have a soft spot for that little boy in the basket. And she took him in and she raised him as her own son. Moses will never understand why that was. And until you understand your purpose, if you try to function on impulses, you will be in bigger trouble. Don't let a motivational speaker tell you what your purpose is. Because even the motivational speaker is not in purpose. God didn't create motivational speakers. <laughs> I know that will piss you right off. It will just annoy you. You'll be so angry at that. Oh, what, what the hell? What do you mean? Perhaps you're, looking, perhaps you're listening to me. And you're a motivational speaker. I don't even know you. So you know that I'm not I'm not out for you. Like I didn't come to attack you because I don't even know you. I don't know you. I think you're an amazing person. I think you have a great destiny. I think you just feel like you have the gift of talking. And so you now conclude. That you should be motivating people. <laughs> your gift is not your destiny. Your gift is not who you are. If I gift you an iPhone, I cannot call you iPhone. And your existence is not iPhone. It doesn't make any sense. If I buy you a pair of shoes, the pair of shoes does not define your existence. It is only a gift. And it's only good for wearing or whatever it is that I gift you, use it for whatever it is meant to be used for, that is as good as it gets. Motivational speaking. The gift of speaking, okay? Now, people now add a motivation to it, okay? It is just the gift of speaking. It is an oratory gift. Now, the gift of speaking is a gift and it stays there. It doesn't make, you cannot define yourself by it. You cannot define yourself by it. <laughs> I saw a post on social media yesterday and I saw this lady. You know these people that put, they, they, they put a video, they'll play it and then they'll let the video play and they'll say they, they, they will now want to break it down to explain to you and, and stuff and give you their opinion about the video. So there's this lady played the video of Steve Harvey. You know the way Harvey does his shows and he brings single people. Like Steve Harvey has advice for everybody. Okay. <laughs> I don't understand. I don't understand how uh, this, this world is so damaged. It's so terrible. <laughs> because the question I will ask is based on what? Based on what? So he can advise anybody. So basically, you know, these people that do TV shows now, you, you literally ask them questions and they will give you answer. Now, who, who? What makes you think this person is better than you? Because they've been able to put together a TV show. Because you feel they're doing better in life in terms of they have a TV show, they have a career. Or you feel they have more money than you, they're wearing a nice looking suit. Or they're wearing a nice looking dress and a makeup and they have cameras everywhere. You now think the person is qualified to give you life advice and people literally will take those things. So someone will wake up. Um, I don't know how you get to attend those things. Do you like feel a form online? Like if I wanted to be like a live audience of yes. alien. Okay, so someone fills a form and they get picked. Say they get picked random. And say you get picked now that you're gonna attend Ellen's show. So you now start thinking, okay, so what question am I gonna ask? What well, what what area of my life do I need direction? So I'm gonna ask Steve Harvey, and he, he will tell me what to do. The only person, the only personality you can come to with such quest is God. And certain men who have found God, whom when you ask them questions, they will not answer you because 
they know. They will answer you because they can retrieve information from the spiritual where God dwells. But someone who is not spiritual, who just read books and has gone through life and then he feels he has... Look, no matter what one man feels he has gone through, his experience is customized to him. And if he does not have the same fingerprint as you, he can never adequately tell you about your life. He will tell you about life from his own scope, from his own lens. No man can... Every man will only speak from the limitation of his own life. So whatever advice you receive from another man, a man that is a man of man, the boundaries of his counsel to you is, is the boundaries of his life. And perhaps you now define a robust life by the kind of car a man drives and the kind of suit he wears and, and the balance of his bank account, then you are among men the most miserable. Because these things are so fickle and transient. They are there today. They are gone tomorrow. Imagine someone who gets financial advice from a billionaire today and the billionaire was going to lose all his wealth next week. <laughs> and then next week, the guy loses all the money. So what, what, what would you then say to yourself? What would you say to yourself? So I'm saying to you now, as a side note, if a man does not have the Spirit of God, provable Spirit of God, provable, if a man does not have the Spirit of God, that you test, because I was test the Spirit, that you can test and it becomes real beyond any reasonable doubt that this man is a man of God. Don't ask him for advice. Don't ask or ask at your own peril. Ask at your own peril. Don't ask someone who does not have the ability, who does not have the bodies of God on his heart, who does not know how to kneel, his, get on his knees and say, God, I know nothing. Tell me. Don't, if a man is not like that, don't ask him questions. Don't ask him for directions in your life. The only one who can give direction is God. And this God makes dates with men. Okay, it creates men. It gives them body in time. It puts spirit in them and it preordained them to meet him. Or better still, it comes to meet them. So, this was such occasion in the life of Moses. When on this day, he was leading the flock and he just kept leading them far away, far away, far away, far away, far away, until he got to, his, to this mountain. Oh, give me someone else who God did something similar to in the Bible. Elijah. After he had finished slaying the prophets of Baal and Jezebel threatened him and he ran away, he goes to the broom tree and... He was tired and he said, God, look, kill me. I'm tired. I don't even know. Why am I here? What am I doing here? Well, look, all these guys are so wicked. Why are, you, why are you trying to make me correct them? They've killed all my ancestors who have made an attempt. So what, why am I different? What, why do you think I'm going to be different? Mr. Elijah, you are not, your course, the course of your life is not before you. You are not carrying out a plan that you made. You're carrying a plan that someone else made. But anyways, maybe you have such questions too. You know, maybe you feel, sometimes, you feel the burden to make a change in this world. Maybe you, you feel like, I, I desire to change the world. Maybe when you feel so much opposition and troubles and chaos and you look at other things that happen in your life, you ask yourself again, who am I to want to change the world? Why am I trying to change? Let the world just die. Like, I don't, I don't care. Like, I, I try. I, has it ever happened to you that you try to be nice to people or you're doing something to help people, to better people, and people are shooting arrows back at you. And then it, it gets to the time you just think, look, why am I even doing this? Like, for all I care, everybody can just go and die. Like, I'm trying, I'm trying to really help. And rather than people seeing what I'm doing as help, they think I'm just, they just see me as an enemy. So I'm gonna just stop trying to help people so that they can just go die. Just do whatever you wanna do, I don't care. There is tendency or there are tendencies that men will get to a place where you feel this way and it just highlights a deficiency in the fact that you don't really know God as you should know Him. 
So at that point, you begin to consider yourself to say, why am I, am I here? Why am I doing this? Why why does everybody hate me? Why can they not see that I'm trying to help? Why can they not see that I'm nice? Why can they not see that I'm trying to be a good person? When you begin to say those things, when you begin to say those things a lot in your life, it, it is God trying to, and sometimes God orchestrates certain situations to cause you to get into a place where your experience with only, the, the only thing you can say is, why, 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 why? And God says, yeah, that, that question is to point you in the right direction. Be careful. It is because God wants you to climb the ladder higher. Do you understand this? He wants us to step the temperature higher. He wants you to change again. Remember, you change and you keep changing and you keep changing states, keep changing states until you become like God. When you become like him, you won't ask those questions anymore because you now know, you understand things beyond what they look like. So Moses, God orchestrated an encounter between himself and Moses in that Moses was leading the flocks as he does probably every day. Maybe he does it three times a week. Maybe he does it two times a week. We don't know how often Moses takes out this flock. But this was what Moses was doing, okay? He was a shepherd. And he was looking after the, the flock of his fa father-in-law. And he would often take them out to graze, okay? And on this occasion, he had not been here before. Because the Bible highlighted the fact that he took them far into the wilderness until he came to the mountain of God. And that was exactly what God did to Elijah too. In that complaint, he was complaining to God and he slept off. And whilst he was sleeping, an angel came and woke him up and told him to eat bread. And the angel said, eat for the journey is long because today you will encounter God. And he ate, he slept. The angel woke him up again and said, eat again, eat more for the journey is long. And he ate again and he drank and he slept. And when he woke up, he started on the journey. He didn't know where he was going. He was just walking. The Spirit of God began to push him because he was going on a day. The Spirit was bringing him to the meeting point and this meeting point was the mountain of God. So you understand now, physical mountains will be there. But this physical mountains is not the mountain because you, I'm told, I've already told you, the height where God dwells is not the height that you can measure by certain kilometers above sea level. But it is used to aid our human understanding. So does God live on physical mountains? No. Can God meet men on physical mountains? Yes. So that the men may understand the concept of height. But the real interpretation of height is the difference in state. The difference in realm. And I perceive in my spirit that God is beginning to occasion and everything that has happened in your life, everything that has led you up until now, the reason why you have not died when the enemy wanted to kill you, the reason why sickness didn't kill you, the reason why poverty has not messed you up beyond repair, the reason why you are still alive, you can still breathe, it is because the reason why the troubles you've been through has not damaged you beyond repair is because God wants you to meet him in time. And the reason why you're hearing my voice today is because you have an appointment, you have a date. And I perceive in the name of Jesus, I perceive and I pray upon that perception that from tonight, as you sleep, even as you sleep, you will begin to have encounters of the God kind. In the name of Jesus, that God will draw you to a place of intimacy. He will draw you to a place where he will give you disclosures about himself and he will tell you about you. That God will bring you to a place where you can truly worship him. And you can truly watch it. So this was Moses' date. I feel like I should round up here. So that we can continue on Sunday. I'll round up here. So Moses arrived at the mountain. Now what began to happen from here, I'm going to start speaking about that on because if I don't stop now I won't stop I know myself I'm just mm -hmm. going to go three hours and I'm still speaking so I'm going to stop it <sighs> God is spirit and hence those who are most worshipping must worship him in spirit and in truth but how can you worship him in spirit and in truth it is not a function of okay so I will now worship God or, or I will now sing no you cannot sing 
Yeah. Your song does not reach God except the singer becomes spirit and then you are singing spiritual songs. It is partaking of a nature that causes you to function within the confines of that nature. Until God becomes real to you as a spirit. Or until you begin to experience the spirituality that God prepared for you. God designed you to live and to partake and to participate in the nature of the spiritual. And until you enter into your spiritual nature, you cannot relate with God. So you can't even worship. God is a spirit. And by his spiritual nature, he is hidden. Not because he's hiding, but because the state and the realm and the realities where God lives is far away from the reality where anything else lives, including flesh, men. But God desires to be known. And the way God makes himself known is that he gives people disclosure. He reveals himself. And if God, when God wants to reveal himself to a man, God will orchestrate an appointment, a meeting, like we saw in Exodus chapter number 3, verse 1. And so I pray for you tonight. As we lay, as we have laid the foundation of this topic called God, and as we begin to explore this topic in subsequent weeks, I pray that you will not miss the appointment that God has said because I perceive in my spirit that God has used this season, this time, to orchestrate an appointment by which men, people, will know and come to meet the God who made them, the God who designed, who knew your name before your birth, and he separated you before you were formed in your mother's womb. He says, I knew thee, and I separated thee, that you will be a prophet unto the nations. God has separated so many of you to become so many things that gives expression to his intention, the thoughts that existed in his mind for which he sent you and he gave you a body and God intends for you to know yourself to know him and to really begin to live and so I pray that even as God has set this meeting point this meeting date that you will not miss it that all of a sudden mundane things will not become very important to you that it will cause you to miss God in the name of Jesus that you will not be carried away by the cares of life the desires to be rich the desire to be wealthy, the desire to be famous, the desire to feel good, experience pleasure, and, and to the detriment of losing and missing your appointment with God. In the name of Jesus. Um, Jacob said, he, he, he got to a place, whilst he was running away from home, running away from his brother, he, he got to a place, and he, he, he took a stone, used it as a pillow, and um, I don't even understand how someone can use a stone as a pillow. Mm -hmm. That's a mystery right there. But he took a stone, he used it as a pillow, and some people have argued and said the stone he used as a pillow must have been one of the stones by which Abraham built an altar because that place, mm -hmm. Bethel, because the place he got there, then he named it Bethel. But we know that Abraham came to Bethel and Abraham built an altar. He lit at that place with altars. So, it, I preached about altars. I don't want to be preaching about altars today. But it is, altar creates an open heaven. It is a place of encounter. It is a place where God meets with men to call covenant. And so, that place is already a spot that has captured divinity. So, when Jacob entered into that place, he, why did he decide to stop there? Think about it. He was journeying on foot and somehow the place, he got to a place and he got tired and he felt, I'll retire here for tonight. And that spot happens to be the exact spot where he needed to be. It was orchestrated. Mm. <laughs> and you can say, oh, he left home. Deceiver. Bastard Jacob deceiver. You can call him names or whatever you like. But everything led him to that encounter. It led him to that encounter. And so maybe you have stolen. Maybe you have prostituted yourself in the past. Maybe you've lived in sin. You've done drugs. You've been involved in all manner of despicable addictions. I don't care what you've been through. I don't care what you've done. I don't care how bad you've had life. Or life has had you. Everything led you to heal. If you're listening to me right now. 
He led you to this to this moment, the moment when God will become real to you, where you will be given an encounter that will change your life forever. And Jacob laid down on this stone and he slept. And his eyes opened in the spirit. And up until this moment, he has always known that, oh my, there was a God that worked with my dad, Abraham. There was a God. Um, this same God was in my life, Isaac. But as for him, he has never met this God. This was his first disclosure. This was he being, this was God introducing himself to Jacob. So that if Jacob believes in God, it will not just be because Abraham spoke about this God. It will not just be because Isaac spoke about it, because he encountered this God by himself. And I pray that from today and in the subsequent weeks, and I pray that you, I, I ask you, please don't miss this series. And what I ask for you is that you will not only know God because your pastor spoke about him in church. You will stop knowing God because your dad prayed, used to pray at home to God and pray in Jesus' name. That this Jesus in whose name people pray, that you will really encounter the person of this Jesus, that he will become real to you, and he will become your Lord and your personal Savior, and he will become your friend and your Lord, the owner of your life, so that you can trust him with your life. You can trust him with your lack. You can trust him with your weakness. You can trust him with your burdens. And so when, when Jacob slept and had that vision and he woke up in the morning, he said, Oh, the Lord was here and I did not know. This must be the gateway to heaven. <laughs> he said, this must be the gate. Like literally when you open it like this, you'll be in heaven because of what he saw. I perceive that God wants to give you that gateway experience. And I pray that you will not miss it for anything in the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name. And so what should you do? Be conscious. Be expectant. Okay? Be intentionally spiritual. Pause from so many things that you do to entertain yourself. Maybe reduce movies and reduce the things that you do. And just spend time to say, God, I am anticipating an encounter with you in the next few days. Can you please make yourself real to me? Zephaniah says, ask for rain in the springtime. Ask God for an encounter when he is giving it. Say, seek me and you will find me. Say, seek the Lord whilst he may be found. Now, God is telling me to tell you, now is a time when God desires to be found. If you seek him now, you will find him. You will find him. And as you do, God will not hide himself from you. He will disclose himself to you. He will give you encounters that will change your life forever. In Jesus' name. Amen. Apostle Victor is my name again. And this is Life Spring Assembly. Um, in subsequent, we're going to be building on the foundation of late today. And the foundation is God. I love you so much. I'll see you on Sunday. Um, until then, keep keeping the kingdom. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. I love you. God bless you. God bless you.